So in 4.4, you can see, uh, we'll try to graph functions where a couple of information will be given, okay? Maybe the uh, interval of the increasing, interval of the decreasing, the critical points, um, concavity, inflection point, these, these informations will be given. So from that, we want to graph the function, okay? So let's see, how can we do that? Okay, so we'll come back to this. Uh, um, but before we want to see one example, okay? Yeah, like this one. Then we'll come back to this uh, uh, guidelines. But let me first show uh, what are the things we could expect and how can we exploit exploit those situations to craft, uh, uh, you know, a couple of really interesting functions. So first of all, um, if you know that the first derivative is decreasing, let's say at a point zero, okay? Let's say at a point zero, our function was decreasing and after, uh, I shouldn't say at a point zero, before the point zero, the function was decreasing. The first derivative was decreasing. And after zero, the function starts to increase, okay? So if you just consider the point zero, can you imagine uh, what should happen there? If you remember, we know that if a point has, you know, decreasing first derivative before it exists, and afterwards, if it starts to increase, you know, from one of the previous theorems, we know that at zero, we expect that the function will have a local minimum, right? We know that, we have seen this theorem uh, before when we were working on mean and max. I guess in 4.1 or 3.11, somewhere, somewhere uh, either in 3.11 or 4.1. So, and uh, if you have um, attended the lecture or seen the videos, you have already seen the theorem, right? So we expect a local minimum there. Okay, now if, you have more than one intervals like, or rather points like this, where you have change of directions, then what should you do? So we just need to plug in each information separately and join those. So for example, if I now consider one, just let's just, say I have a, uh, a point where uh, before that point, my function was concave up. Now, if you remember what's concave up, that means if you, um, if you draw a tangent line at those points, Or, or okay, let me let me ask you this way. Can anyone tell me how to identify if a function is concave up at a point or or at a certain interval? How to how to how to identify that graphically? Anyone? Because these these informations will be needed. We need to know the basic criteria, basic requirements. It's easy to understand how it's decreasing or increasing, but uh, what should we do uh, for concave up or concave down? Anyone? We have seen this before, right? 
just give it a try, even though it's wrong. No worries. Don't we look at um, the second derivative of the problem? So the second derivative, uh, so how to do that on graph? If, it, if a function is zero, oh. I can understand, but how to do that on a graph? Just by like looking at it is what you're asking right now? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you can just eyeball a graph, you don't have anything else, you still need to say that whether it's concave up or down, how can you do that? Based off the curve. Okay, so based on the curve, what should we expect if we, if we are trying to say that it's concave up? like kind of an open, half open U shape. I don't know what to call it. Uh, yeah, okay, good try. Anyone else? Okay, so if you are given a graph, all you need to do, so let's say, we are, we are trying to find what's happening before and after this point one, okay? So what we'll do, we'll start uh, uh, before, this, uh, uh, before this point one and see how the tangent is behaving and check the uh, behavior of tangent afterwards as well. So if it's concave up, that means your uh, derivatives will be on the rise, okay? And if it's concave down, then it will, or rather, or, you, you, or I might say the best way to see is if you can find a point where the concavity gets zero. I mean, uh, the, I should say the first derivative gets zero. If you can find a point like this, then you will see uh, before that point and after the point, uh, the derivatives uh, will change. For example, uh, let me show this one. Uh, not this one. Where is that graph? I have a really good graph for it. If you remember, I did show one last time. Hopefully, you can, yeah, there you go. This is the best graph you can imagine. If you can remember this scenario, then it's really easy to you know imagine um, if the information is given. I mean, for a graph, you know, when you are trying to graph a function the information will be given, right? Nothing else will be given. So the most important thing is to visualize it in your head. So what happens when it's when we say it's concave up? Let's see that. So as I said, all you need to find is, 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 is to see if there is a point when the first derivative is zero. If you can find that, then it's really easy to see where it's concave up. So, for example, at this particular point, whatever it is, I know it's pi over two, but let's say you don't know. At this point, you can see there is a parallel tangent line, right? That means the tangent is zero. The slope of the tangent is zero. So for concave up, all you need to remember that your slope of the tangent will get increased as you move to your right. That means, oops, someone in the waiting room, give me a second. Okay. That means if you're, if you're moving to your right on the real axis, real number line, so that means if you start from here and go to your right, your slope of the tangent will also increase. So if you consider this particular point, we know at this point it's zero because we have a parallel line, we can, we can imagine a line, uh, even though it was not given, we can 
clearly match in a parallel line, <coughs> excuse me, to the x-axis at this point, right? So before, just before this point, if you draw a tangent line, you can see it's negative. Just after the, this point, if you draw a tangent line, you will see it's, it will, the slope of the tangent will be positive. That means from negative to zero to positive. So as you are moving to your right, the tangent, so the slope of the tangent is slowly and slowly getting increased, right? And same goes for the concave down. I mean, not same, the opposite direction. So we can imagine a parallel line here, even though it was not uh, drawn, we can imagine because it's the uh, minimum, uh, maximum point, right? So at the maximum or at the minimum point, if it's not the boundary point, we expect a parallel line to the x-axis, right? That's why the first derivative is zero. So if we draw tangent lines here, these will be positives. Here it will be zero and afterwards it, it, will, it will be negative. That means you can clearly imagine that it is slowly and slowly getting decreased. Okay, the slope of the tangent dec is decreasing as you are moving to your right. So if that's the case, that means if you, you can draw a slope at a point and, and as you move to your right, if you see the slope is actually getting increased, then you, you say that it's concave up. So that means you might have these two cases. Let me show this as well. Uh, yeah, this one. These two. I, I wish I could show this together, but let me give you a reminder. So for example, you can see uh, if you draw tangent lines here, okay, uh, it will be positive, right? Then if you draw a tangent line here, it will be zero and then it will be positive here again. So what does this mean? So at this point, your derivative is zero. It was positive here. So how can one reach, how can you reach from a positive value to zero? Definitely, uh, if it's only possible if your slope of the tangent is getting decreased, right? You cannot reach from say positive three to zero unless you slowly and slow, slowly uh, uh, get, uh, get lower values. Can you feel this? Just take your time, okay? Because graphing uh, a function with these information will be really interesting. But as long as you actually know what, what does this mean, Try to imagine, okay? Try to, try to digest all this, not really memorize this. Memorizing won't really help. So, so my question again, you have a positive slope here, right? Do you agree with that? At this part of the graph, you have a positive slope. Do you agree? Is there anyone who doesn't agree? I agree. And from a positive value, whatever it is, whatever it is, you are getting a zero because you can, if you draw a tangent line here, definitely it will be parallel to the x-axis, right? So how can you go from a positive value to zero? Isn't it only possible, only if and only if your value gets lower and lower as you move to your right? Do you agree? Okay, now, as you are moving to your right, if you agree that your value is slowly and slowly getting decreased because it was positive here and zero here, that's the definition of concave down, isn't it? So if you consider this point C before this, it was concave down because even though it was positive, it was slowly, get, slowly and slowly getting decreased. Otherwise it can't be zero somewhere. 
all of a sudden. So if your first derivative, the slope of the tangent, in other words, is getting decreased as you're moving to your right, then we know it's concave down. Do you agree? And, and same goes for this part of the graph as well. So it was zero here. And if you start drawing tangents, you will see a positive slope here. So from zero, it is going to positive values. Definitely, if you are moving to your right, your value or your slope of the tangent is getting increased, right? You're going from zero to a, to, a, to a positive value, whatever it is. It's only possible if, if the value is getting increased, right? So it's concave up for this part. And you can use this imagination, or rather, I shouldn't say imagination here because you can see this, but when, you're, when the graph is not given or when you are required to draw the graph, you can imagine this scenario, okay? Uh, is there any other examples? Yeah, I think uh, you can always come back to these graphs. Just remember it's 4.3, slide 24, 25, or, or the in entire slide, I would say. Yeah, 26, 27, these are good examples as well. Yeah, let me, let me uh, ask you, why do you think this part of the graph is concave up? Anyone, can anyone explain? Increasing. Uh, what, what increasing, I mean? Oh, that's the original. I thought this was like a derivative graph, Never mind. Yeah, it's the original uh, curve for y equals f of t, whatever the function is, doesn't matter. But uh, they are saying, obviously we trust them, they're saying that uh, it's concave up for this part of the graph. But why do you think it should be concave up? What are the characteristics you can locate here, which uh, can convince you that, yeah, it should be concave up? Anyone? Just give it a try. Using the definition, you know. Yeah, go for it. It shows T increasing and it's F of T. Um, so in this case also, the T is increasing, but it's still saying concave down. Now, what can I tell, tell about it? The rate of change is decreasing. How do you think it's decreasing? I mean, it, it, let's say I don't really uh, know anything. I just only know the definition that, uh, if the slope of the tangent is decreasing as you are moving to your right, that means as you're increasing the values of t here, your slope of the tangent is decreasing. I just only know this definition of concave down. So can you convince me that, yeah, it is actually concave down? If all of you can convince me that this is concave down and this is concave up, even though both the functions are increasing, then you are all set to use these informations uh, in 4.4. But if you still have doubts, we want to clarify this first. Otherwise it would be difficult to draw these graphs, okay? Is there anyone who is confused or uh, who can convince me. I mean, let me try both ways. If you're confused, let me know. If you can con convince me, let me know as well. You'll need this, uh, you know, complete clear understanding, you know, of this to draw graphs using the information you have. You'll have rather. So is there anyone who can try to convince me why 
it's concave up and why it's concave down, even though both are increasing, both functions are increasing. Anyone, just give it a try. If you if you try, you know, even though uh, uh, you, you don't think it's uh, good enough or convincing enough, if you try, you will see uh, the things you need to know, which will actually help the cause, okay, to clarify your concept. No one at all? Okay, let me, let me try and convince you again. So let's forget about this uh, side note. Just, just try to use our uh, concept here. So at this point somewhere, I can imagine a tangent parallel to the T axis. Do you agree? Even I, I think at this point, if you draw a tangent line, it will be close to parallel uh, uh, to the t-axis. Is it involving mean and max? Um, not always. In some cases, it will involve mean and max. Okay, so I can imagine in somewhere here, maybe at this very point, if I draw a tangent line, it will be parallel to the t-axis. Do you agree with that? Do you agree? Or can you actually see this? At least you can see that it's, it's pretty close to being parallel to the t-axis, right? And if you move forward, you can see the tangents, the slope of the tangents are getting bigger. Don't just trust me. If you, if you can draw a line uh, on your scratch paper, if you have any in front of you, just draw a curve like this and try to uh, draw tangent at, at some of these points. Move to your right, I mean, go to your right, increase your value of T and at the corresponding values on the graph, try to draw tangent lines. You'll see it will, it will increase as you move to your right, like this. Do you agree? Don't just trust me. If you are confused, let me know, as I said. If you are confused and if you don't let me know, I'm, I can't, I won't be able to help you, right? Let's try this one. So looks like, again, looks like, at somewhere here, there is a line, if you draw, I mean, if you draw a tangent line, it will be parallel to the T axis, right? Somewhere here. And if you start imagine, as imagining from here, if you start drawing tangent lines, you'll see it will slowly and slowly, the slope slowly and slowly will get decreased. Can you see the lines? Imagine a line I'm drawing here starting from here. This line will go like this. This will go like this. You can see the slope of the tangent is slowly and slowly getting decreased. Do you agree? And that's the definition of concave down. Any question from this? I know we are reviewing this stuff, but I could see some of you are still, uh, some of you who still have doubts with, uh, on the graphical representation of concavity. No questions at all? All good? Okay, let's go back to 4.4 and see if we can. Um, use these informations to draw the graph. Okay, all right. So for this uh, part of the graph, you can see if I start drawing tangent lines here, 
right? It's actually getting increased as I'm moving to my right. So it's concave up. And for this part of the graph, if I go to my right, I can see the slope is slowly and slowly getting decreased. So it's concave down. And it will be actually, or rather will be doing this in the uh, opposite order. That means concave up will be said, will be using this information to draw the graph. Now, now if I say that uh, from negative infinity to zero, uh, our first derivative is negative and it's concave up in that interval, then from zero to one, our first derivative is increasing and it's still concave up uh, in that interval. And at one, we have an inflection point and from one to two, our first derivative is still increasing, but it's now it's concave down. Then can we draw this graph? That's the question. If yes, how? So first of all, uh, from negative infinity to infinity, our information said that the first derivative is decreasing. Then from zero to one, it said the first derivative is increasing. So I expect at zero, we have a local minimum. Or rather we expect, right? So we can imagine that there should be a bowl-like shape here. Okay, we, we, we can just start, you know, it may not be the right, th right thing, but we can start imagining this and then we'll combine all of this to get our final result, right? Okay, then again, from one to two, uh, our first derivative is still increasing, but we have said that it goes from concave up to concave down. So that means at one, we have an inflection point, okay? So that means if the, if the function uh, or if the slope of the tangent was increasing at this point, it will be uh, decreasing on this part of the graph. So that means it will be uh, zero somewhere here, right? So if we join this, we'll get a shape like this. You know, a half S or horizontal S, something like that. And if you, if you are able to just understand up to this, Bingo, you're done. Because for uh, finding these graphs, especially in your homeworks, that couple of options will be given, okay? So if you can understand this, that the graph looks like this uh, horizontal S or something like that, you'll see uh, you'll have one option like that. There can't be two options using this in same information, which is, uh, which is true. Using this information there, you can only draw one uh, precise graph. You can't really imagine any other things. It can't be this way, right? So we'll be using this to draw graphs, but before that, again, let's see the guidelines and we'll, we'll come back to it, okay? Any questions up to this? Anything that's, that's confusing? Maybe it's the first time you're seeing this, so if it's not making too much sense, no worries, we'll, we'll practice a lot of this, okay? On, on this discussion, on the homeworks, and of course, uh, before exam, you'll practice uh, a couple of from the 
workout problems or even from the exercise, right? So slowly and hopefully it will make more sense. No questions at all? Okay, let's let's see the guidelines. So the first one says, identify the domain or the interval of interest. Now, let us quickly, really quick, go back to the definition of domain. Can anyone tell me the definition of domain? Although, we haven't really um, gone deep into the concept of domain on this particular course because um, we have seen this before in the pre-calc or even in the algebra class, I guess uh, definitely in the pre-calc. -pre so what's the definition of domain? Isn't it the area between two points? Uh, not really. Anyone else? The, dom the domain is the range of x values you can have. Range of x values for what? Yeah, you're almost right, but just... in in the interval um, slash that that will put out a y value in a function. Yeah, I can I can see what you're trying to say. Yeah, so the thing is, the domain is the x values for which your graph, or I should say function, your function will have a defined value, okay? It is the x values for which your function will have a defined value. Let me quickly show one example. Not this one. Uh, Okay, yeah, let's, let's, let me just quickly show you the domain from this graph. So from negative infinity to negative one, we have a defined value. Obviously the negative one is not included, so you can't really have brackets there. You can only have parentheses. So from negative infinity to negative one, uh, you have a defined value, then at negative one, you don't have a defined value of the function. Then again, from negative one to zero, or, or I should say, yeah, negative one to one, uh, again, uh, in parentheses, that means both sides open, negative one and one not included. Again, you have a defined value. And at positive one, you don't have a defined value. And then from positive one to positive infinity, you have a defined value. So that means your domain is negative infinity to negative one, both sides open, then negative one to one, both sides open, then one to positive infinity, both sides open. Or in other words, if you try to simplify it more, you could say the domain for this function is every real number apart from negative one and one. Or other than negative one and one, any values, any real values will be a part of our domain. Only negative one and positive one will not be a part of our domain. Because you can see there is no defined value at positive one and at negative one. So this is the domain. That means you need to have a defined value for those for that particular function, whatever it is. Okay. So one of the most important things is to understand your domain, or it said interval of interest. Now, what does that mean? So that means your questionnaire will actually give you a certain interval. You don't need to imagine anything beyond that interval. 
or beyond those intervals, I might say, you might be given two or three intervals. And you, you just need to use the next couple of information, so whatever you have in, in those intervals, not beyond that, okay? All right, next, uh, exploit the symmetry. Now, what is a symmetry? Uh, I think uh, I briefly explained this a uh, couple of days back. Uh, that is, if you can uh, draw a line, or if you can imagine a line, you don't need to draw a line, if you can imagine a line, or for your convenience, just for a couple of seconds, if you can draw a line and you know, on the on both sides of that line, if you can see uh, the graph is behaving same or the, have the same behavioral aspects, that means it's going in the same way on both sides of that line, then the, from the graphical representation of that, we say we have a symmetry. For example, uh, I hope I can find one real quick. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, this one is a good one. So if you can imagine this line, you can see on our, on our left, the graph is behaving like this. And on our right, right the graph is behaving like this. So it's behaving almost the same but it's not exactly the way it behaved uh, on our left. If it, it behaved like this, you know, if it, if it had created a shape, uh, M-like shape, then on our left and on our right, we would have had the same, uh, same looking graphs, right? So we would have said that it's a symmetry. Can you imagine? Just imagine this graph, instead of going to, uh, downwards, if it was like this, same way as this, right? We would have said this line is creating a symmetry. So how can you use that? So if you have a function, you can actually check uh, whether it's even or odd, or it might be said that it's, it's an even function or it's an odd function. Now, how can you use that? So first of all, let us quickly go back to the definition of even and odd function. If you plug in a negative value of X and if you still get the positive, uh, I mean the main function in return without the change of sign, even though you have changed the value of x to negative x, still you get the same function in return, then we, we call it an even function. And if you just change the value and get the negative function in return, then you call it an odd function. Let me quickly tell you one example each. So let's imagine f of x equals x squared. Okay, your function, let's imagine it's x squared. So if you plug in negative x in place of um, x uh, you have for the function, can you see what you are getting in return? You are still getting positive x squared. Do you agree? Do you agree? Let me start showing the screen, uh, hopefully. This will be more convenient for you guys to understand. So what I want you to do is to have this slide open in front of you. And meanwhile, keep an eye on the screen I'm sharing as well. Okay. okay. Can you see the screen I'm sharing? is 21. So have that 
uh, slide open uh, because you'll need this. Uh, and you just need to cross check it with the screen I'm sharing, okay? So if you have f of x equals x squared, if I plug in negative x, let's see what happens. I'll replace my x's with negative x, and negative x, the quantity squared, is still x squared. Do you agree? And f of x, uh, sorry, uh, x squared is actually f of x, right? So from ne negative x, we are actually getting the same function in return. So we call it an even function. Any question from this? I guess most of you have already seen this. Still, if you have any question, just let me know. Now let's see what happens for an odd function. So if you replace x for, uh, or rather by negative x in the function x cubed, since it's an odd exponent, we'll definitely have a negative in front, right? And I can write it as negative times x cubed. I'm just trying to show how it's done. And this guy is actually just f of x. So we started from, ah, oh, I'm doing this again. From this, f of negative x is actually giving us negative f of x. We call it as an odd function. We define it as odd function. Any question from this? No questions at all? Okay. So if this information is given, whether it's odd or even, um, then it's really uh, an advantage for us. How? So if we know that even if we change the values to negative, we'll still get the same function, or in other words, if, if we know what the function is even, then actually it helps us to imagine that this is the positive values of x, right? And this is the negative values of x. So we can imagine that the function will behave similarly on both sides of zero. Because we have, we know the function is even. That means for negative x, we actually have the same uh, behavior. So for example, if we, if we just draw this graph, I'm just showing one example, okay? How to use this, how to exploit this. So for negative x, it will also have x squared, right? Sorry, my iPad is creating some problems. Sorry about that, okay. So that means if we have, if we have just a couple of values on our right, if we know and plug in, let's say a couple of values and know that the graph is going like this, straight away without doing any further calculation for any uh, negative x values, we can just uh, use this as a mirror. Okay, let's imagine we have a mirror here and just copy this part here. 
that's it it's slightly bigger than i wanted to do okay yeah so that means if we have a mirror here these will be mirror image of each other it's the symmetry we are talking about Okay, so we can use this information so we'll, we'll see more examples of it. Okay, how to use this symmetry. Okay, the next thing is if you can eyeball the slide, uh, it says number three, find the first and second derivatives. So using the first and second derivatives, we know we can derive lots of information. You know, uh, the extreme values, obviously concavity, inflection points, critical points, uh, intervals of increase, intervals of decrease, right? We can actually determine a lot of things from this, uh, from these derivatives, first and second derivatives, okay? And we'll be using this, and we have seen uh, one example of this, that how to use this first and second derivatives to graph a function, right? We'll, we'll see more examples soon. Next one says, find critical points and possible inflection points. Okay, um, obviously, uh, if, we, if we know that we have a critical point somewhere or an inflection point somewhere, it definitely uh, gives us a head start because we, we know that we can start from there if we know how to deal with the critical points and inflection points, right, using the definition. So inflection point is the point where your concavity changes. That means from concave down, it goes to concave up or vice versa. And for the critical points, we know that either there will be a uh, minimum or maximum value at that point, or the first derivative will not exist at that point. That means there will be a, a corner point, or in other words, if we draw a tangent line there, it will be vertical to the x-axis. We know the definition, so we can use this. Next, find the intervals on which the function is increasing or decreasing, obviously, uh, uh, for a certain interval. If it's increasing, we know how it's behaving. We can't really conclude because if you, if you remember, increasing doesn't mean that it goes like this. It even might go, go like this, right? So at least first of all, we need to identify or we need to know whether it's increasing or not. If it's increasing, then we need to know whether it's concave up or down. So for this one, it's concave up. For this one, it's concave down. We know the shapes, how it, how it behaves, right? Even though on both occasions, it's increasing. So first of all, we want to know whether it's increasing or not. Then we want to know it, whether it's concave up or down. If we know these two informations, we can clearly imagine how will it behave. Do you agree? Right? Okay. Now, uh, the good thing is though, if the function itself is given, if somehow, let's say, I give you, a, give you the function, then it's even better, right? If the function is given, I can actually calculate this. I can find the derivatives. I can solve, I can set this to zero and solve it for x. I can uh, set or rather I myself can calculate the intervals of increasing the concavity and, and find all of this, right? I have, I have shown you one example how to do this 
for a function. Uh, why is that? Yeah, here we go for this one. If, if a function is given, you can actually find the critical points, the intervals where it's increasing, the intervals where it's decreasing, the interval where it's concave up, the interval where it's concave down, the inflection points, all of this, you can easily calculate it. So if the function is given, it's even better. But not always the function will be given. Instead, in some occasions, the, only the informations will be given that, hey, for your function, whatever it is, uh, in this interval, let's say from A to B, it will be increasing but concave down. For example, I'm just setting up an example. Not always the function will be given, but in some cases, the function will be given. And from that function, you, you can actually derive these informations. If the function is not given, then the informations will be given. You don't need to calculate that. It can't be both, it will be either of this. Either the function will be given or the information will be given. Either way, uh, eventually we'll need these information to draw the graph. Okay, now next we need to identify the extreme values and the inflection points if there is any. So if we can calculate the first and second derivatives, obviously we can locate the extreme values and the inflection points, if any, right? We know how to do that. We have seen this before. But are we done? No. We may need to see a couple of more things. One of the things would be to see the asymptotes, if we have any asymptotes. That means if there is any line which uh, our graph will not cross, neither touch, neither touch nor cross it, if there is any point like this. So if the information is given that, hey, at x equals, uh, let's say x equals a, you have an asymptote, you have a vertical asymptote, that means if you have a graph, obviously at A, you can imagine a line like this, right? But if, we, if the function is given, then you actually need to calculate it, whether we have, a, uh, have an asymptote or not. And we know how to calculate or how to find the asymptote, right? If we have a fraction, we just need to see where does the denominator become zero? At those values, we'll have a vertical asymptote. Right? Okay. And we can use the concept of asymptotes to see other asymptotes as well. Uh, if the function is given, it will not be a problem. Uh, we'll, we'll see examples of it, hopefully. Um, Next, we need to see the intercepts. Um, it's, if the function is given, it's really easy to locate the intercepts. If we set the function to zero, whatever we have for x, I mean, if we solve it for x, these will be y-intercepts. Sorry. Uh, I, should, I shouldn't say y-intercept, it should be x-intercepts, right? Uh, functional value is zero, that means y is zero, yeah. This is x-intercepts. And if you just set x equals zero, uh, and then whatever you get for that function, then it will be y-intercept. For example, if you have, let's say, f of x equals 2x plus 3. So if you set this to 0 and solve it, 2x plus 3 equals 0. So if you solve it for x, you'll have negative 3 halves. 
So this will be your x intercept. And if you said x equals zero, that means f of zero, which is two times zero plus three, this will be your y-intercept, okay? And knowing these points will be really helpful because we will know where it will cross the axis, right? Okay, and yeah, that's it. If we can combine these ideas, we can actually draw graphs. Or if we are given multiple choice, multiple choices, we can actually pick one which actually, uh, which fits best, fits the data best, fits the information best. We can actually pick that from the given information we have either we have or whether we have or other or we have derived from the function so any questions so far although we haven't seen a graph um, combining all all these guidelines together uh, but any questions so far from the definitions or, or the guidelines any question I can't see anything in the chat, so hopefully you don't have any question. Okay, if you don't have any question, uh, I think we are already past, uh, yeah, it's already 10.13. Anyway, um, let's take a five minutes break to refresh our minds and then we'll see a real example where we'll be using these informations and uh, we'll try to draw a graph, okay? So see you in five minutes. Uh, let's meet at uh, 10, 19, okay? All right. Who wants to tell me the solution for the second derivative. What do you get for this x? I didn't get far enough to get all the x values, but I did get it simplified, if I could tell you that. OK, is there anyone who, who has this? values of x. No one, really? You didn't have uh, enough time to solve it for x? Yes. OK, what's the value? Do you have the value or you just? Yeah, I, 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 know, I, write, I know I write the value. When, we, when the break room, um, when the break room, um, the break up room um, expired. I don't, I don't understand. Did you, did you calculate the value? Yeah, I didn't calculate the value when the break, when the break up room expired. I do have the enough time to calculate the value. Eight minutes was not enough, really? That's strange. Anyway, um, um, the, the, pro the problem is that I, I, um, I have a um, problem hearing you from where I am, so I didn't get the um, the, when you asked us to ask question, I wanted to ask question before the break uh, before you um, before you put us in the break uh, break uh, break room. So when I was calculating it, um, I was on the verge of getting the um, x value when the um, the break room expired. That's why. Okay. Anyway, so so the thing is. Uh, 
Are you? Yeah. Um, so for the X values, it's just where you gave that negative square root of three minus one and then one and square root of three that you wanted to see what, what we got uh, when we plug those in? No, no, no. I did say you need to solve this one for X, the second derivative. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you solve this for X, uh, uh, you know, this will be your homework, homework assignment. After we finish, I want you guys to solve it. I don't know why eight minutes was not enough. Oh, it should have been enough anyway. So um, no worries, you can still solve it after we finish. And then all you need to do is to check where this is concave up and where this is concave down. Okay, so now, uh, did anyone do this part? I mean, where it's increasing and where it's decreasing? In which interval? Yeah, I did. Okay, what did you get? I got it's increasing over negative infinity to negative root three. Okay. And then root three to root inf er, to infinity. Okay. And decreasing and then, everywhere else? Yeah. Okay. Did, did someone else get the same as him? Is there anyone else who has a different result other than this? So all of you agree with this? That means it's increasing in this interval from negative infinity to negative square root of three and positive square root of three to, to infinity. And in the other three intervals, it's actually decreasing. Okay, let's just agree with Matthew. Okay, now let's try to draw this graph. Okay. So first of all, I know that I have a vertical asymptote. I, I, I think I have more than one vertical asymptotes. Yeah, at negative one and at positive one. Right, let's do this. So this is my negative one, this is my positive one, and I have vertical asymptotes here. So that means I can do this, right? So these are my vertical asymptotes at negative one and positive one. Okay, now, next we have uh, increasing from negative infinity to negative square root of three. Let's just first find out where the negative square root of three would be. So if that's one, that would be two. And we know square root of three is 1.7320. So that means it's somewhere here, right? It's somewhere here. And for positive square root of three, again, if it's one, it's, it should be two, and square root of three should be somewhere here, right? Okay, and from negative infinity to negative square root of three, I know the function E is increasing. Okay, so that is negative square root of three, and up to this, the function is increasing. Now, how should, should we draw this? So before doing this, I want you to take back, I want to take you back to the main function to show you that, uh, can we have any other type of um, asymptotes here? Can you imagine any other type of asymptote here? And the answer is yes. Since yes, okay. Uh, since the exponent in the numerator, or I should say, I shouldn't say exponent. The degree that means the highest exponent in the numerator is bigger than the highest exponent in the denominator, 
what can we conclude? Do you remember? Should it have a slant asymptote? Very good. We have a slant asymptote. And how to find the slant asymptote? Let me give you a quick reminder. You just need to find the uh, quotient for this. So our function is 10x cubed um, over what? Over x squared minus one. So you just need to divide this. Oops, sorry. We just need to divide this and find the quotient. So if we need, if we can divide this, we get 10x, right? Because 10x times x squared would be 10x cubed. And this would give us a minus 10. So it would be positive 10 as the reminder, but the quotient would be 10x, right? Just simply divide it and find the quotient. So at y equals 10x, we have a slant asymptote. So we just need to draw it here. So that's y equals 10x. Oh, oh I shouldn't use this. Instead, I should use this. That's the slant asymptote, okay? And now I can draw the graph. I know up to negative, in, uh, negative square root of three, it's increasing. So that's negative square root of three. So it should behave like this. Oops, sorry. Yeah, like this. And then it starts to decrease. So it will go like this because of the uh, asymptote, right? Because we have an asymptote here. Then we know for all this part, it's decreasing. And when you will solve the second derivative, we'll see we'll have an inflection point here at x equals zero. It will behave like this. I'm leaving, leaving it for you. And again, we know from positive infinity to uh, from one to positive infinity, a positive square root of three, it's decreasing. So that's my one, that's positive square root of three, it's decreasing, so it will behave like this. And from positive square root of three to infinity, it's increasing, so it, it will go like this. Now you might be wondering, how did I get this part this easily? And I'll take you back to this because this is an odd function. So since we have this part, this will behave exactly like that, but in the opposite order. Okay, I think we are running short of time. So we'll start from here the next time when we meet tomorrow. But before that, your pre-class assignment would be to find this x values, just set the second derivative to zero and solve it for x. And subdivide the intervals using this x values like the way I have done here. Is the question clear? That's the first thing. I guess uh, somehow, for some reasons, the question was not clear when I created the breakout room. I take the blame, maybe I didn't say it properly, but is the question clear for tomorrow? Yeah, could you, could you scroll back up so I can see the equation again? I think I wrote it down wrong. Yeah, there you go. So note, it, note this down. Your pre-class assignment would be to solve the second derivative, find the x values, and subdivide the intervals using this in x values like the way we have done here. Okay. And we'll start from this graph, this particular graph tomorrow. I wish I had at least five to 10 more minutes, but I know some of you will go for work and, and one or two of you have some other class as well. So I won't really hold you back, but uh, no worries. We'll start from here and we'll probably see one or two more graphs tomorrow. Um, Mr. Aik, uh, I, I would like to see you. Okay, just wait in the meeting room. Uh, let, let, let's just wait for others to leave the meeting. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to ask actually on the, on le on the lesson today is that um, the, the second derivative is the assignment for tomorrow. 
yeah, the second derivative, solve the second derivative for x, yeah. So we don't need to like take the derivative again, we're just solving for x. Right, right, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, you already okay. have the second awesome. derivative, you. you just need to solve it for x. Okay. 